Matthew chapter 3. In the scripture, we often read of times of reformation. Now, times of reformation are always preceded by times of backsliding, times of sin, times of moving away from the Lord. And God has always been faithful to raise up his servants, his men, his prophets, his evangelists, to bring his people back to his word and back to his ways. That's what a, what a reformer does. Brings the people back to God's word and back to God's ways. We see this often in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the reforms during the time of King Hezekiah's reign, as he desired to bring God's people back into obedience to God's laws. We saw it in the time of Josiah the king, who did the same. And in the times of Nehemiah, we remember how that man was sent into the land where God's people dwelt to remind them that God is yet on the throne and they needed to get back to his word and back to his ways. Times of reformation are commonly recorded in scripture and they are commonly recorded in church history. We need often to be reminded of where we stand with the Lord, where we've gone and where we need to be brought back to. When we drift away from the word, we need to be brought back to God's word. When we begin to neglect the ways of the Lord, we need to be exhorted and charged to return and obey the ways of God. And so here in Matthew chapter 3, we see a great reformer come on the scene. Here in verse 1, the man of God steps on the scene. A great reformer calling God's people back to him. And before we get any further, let's read these four verses. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. The man of God, the man that God has raised up to call out to his people as a voice cries out in the wilderness, proclaiming the message of the Lord. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. This preaching caused an uproar in Jerusalem and in the surrounding regions as we see in verses 5 and 6. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him. He's causing an uproar. He's causing a stir. He is causing great revival as we will look at next week as we study those particular verses in greater detail. This preaching caused an uproar. His proclamation was singular, it was solemn, and it was urgent. Repent. You must repent now. Don't delay. Today is the day of salvation. You must consider your heart before God. Repent, repent, repent. And it was urgent because he proclaimed this message with the idea that there was something coming upon the world. There was something coming upon mankind's kingdom. Mankind's kingdom was fading away and God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, was at hand. His preaching caused an uproar. His proclamation, it was singular, it was solemn, it was urgent. His personal appearance, his attire, his appetite, it was modest, it was humble. As we see there in verse 4, clothed in camel's hair, wearing a simple leather belt, and his food being locust and honey. This shows us a man who is not seeking after the glory of God, but is seeking rather to give all glory and praise to God. Notice, he was not seeker-friendly, was he? he? He didn't go into Jerusalem and establish himself. Rather, he began to preach. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. He, he was not interested in lifting himself up. He was simply faithful to the message. 
and trusted in the Lord to bring his people out to him. He was not seeker friendly. He was not seeking after the glory of God. He was seeking rather to give all glory to God. And notice his raiment, his clothing, it's humble, it's modest. He wasn't trying to be attractive. He wasn't trying to entice anybody. He wanted nothing to distract from his important message, from his mission, from his solemn and urgent proclamation that men and women needed to repent, that God's kingdom was at hand, that men needed to ready themselves to meet the Lord. They needed to prepare their hearts for the Lord. And so his appearance spoke to his character. He was modest. He was humble. He came preaching. He didn't come to attract. He came preaching. His power, his authority, wasn't in his outward attire. It wasn't in the fancy feast that he enjoyed, or the banquets that he went to, or the, the people and the celebrities that he would visit. There was none of that in his life. He, he wasn't on TBN with gold and diamonds and, and fancy suits and, and slicked back hair. John was a man who said, nothing comes between me and the message. Nothing comes between me and what God's will is for my life. There is nothing in my life that keeps me from honoring God in the great call that he has made upon my life. He came preaching. He came with power. He came with authority. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now where did this power come? Where did this authority come from? He was truly invested with this power and authority from on high. Matthew interrupts his story to remind us, this man, John the Baptist, this great man, this man that Jesus said, he is the greatest of all people who have ever been born of women. There is none greater than John the Baptist. Matthew says, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He came with divine authority, with prophetic authority. God had specially chosen him for this particular proclamation to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare the way for the coming Christ. Let's look at this a little further. Hold your finger over here and just turn a few pages to the right to Matthew, excuse me, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. John the Baptist, his father was a priest in the temple who one day was visited by the angel Gabriel. In verse 15 of Luke chapter 1, the angel declared to Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, he said, your son, for he, your son, will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And of course, we remember that story when Mary showed up at Elizabeth's house. The baby, John the Baptist, left within his mother Elizabeth's womb at the very uh, nearness of Mary who was carrying the Lord Jesus within her. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him. He'll go before the Christ. He'll go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Let's turn back over to Matthew. So we see here the prophecy of Isaiah. We see here Gabriel confirming that the prophecy of Isaiah is about to be fulfilled in the coming child, John the Baptist. And such was the events, such were the events concerning around John the Baptist's birth that the people who were there when he was named said, what kind of a child will this turn out to be? Look at all the incredible events that have led up to his birth. Parents that are beyond childbearing years. This miraculous sign of the angel when Zacharias was serving in the temple. And the mystery behind his own name when, when they named him John. That caused quite confusion in the family. Well, what are you talking about naming him John? There's no one named John in your family. That's what the angel said. You're going to name him John. 
So people began to wonder, what thing will come to pass with the birth of this child? What is he going to turn out to be? What kind of a child will John the Baptist, what kind of a man will this child become? So he came preaching, and he came with power and authority invested in him from on high. He preached with the Holy Spirit, and he preached with power. He preached direct. He didn't skate around the issues. He was pointed in his address. You must repent. He was clear. He was concise. He didn't mince words. He didn't mix people up. He didn't twist scriptures. He was direct, pointed, clear. He was bold. He was courageous, as we'll see later on in his life, as he rebuked the authorities in his day. He was courageous, and he was on fire. This man burned with holy passion for the Lord and to fulfill the great call that was upon his life, even from his mother's womb. He had been chosen for this, and now he comes upon the scene, and he has been prepared, and he begins to act with Holy Spirit power. And as I said, he was not seeker-friendly. He was sinner-offensive. He, he didn't go and try to convince people. He stayed out in the wilderness and simply cried out as a voice crying out in the wilderness. He caused a stir. He caused an uproar. He told sinners to repent. He confronted people with their sin. He was sinner-offensive. He wasn't attempting to compromise in a way to gather fame to himself. He preached the scandalous gospel. He would later, as Jesus came on the scene, and you and I know the rest of the story, of course, he would point people to Christ and claim that there was salvation in no other, for that was the Lamb of God who alone could take away the sin of the world. He preached the sovereignty of God and the depravity of man. He reminded people that they were not on the throne. They were not invited to sit on the throne. There was one in heaven who ruled and reigned over the earth, and men and women are accountable to him. He kicked people off of their mythical thrones, the thrones that men and women believe they sit on. I run my own life. Don't tell me what to do. I do my own thing. I don't have to listen to you. Don't rebuke me. Don't talk about me like that. John the Baptist would have none of it. He preached the sovereignty of God, and he preached that men must bow the knee to the holy God of heaven. He preached that men were depraved in God's sight and that they must repent. There was no way around it. There was nothing they could do. There was no merit they could earn. They were lost. They were dying. They were corrupted. They were polluted. They were sinful. The only thing that they could do is repent. He preached repentance. He preached judgment. Notice in verse 12, speaking of the coming Christ, his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. God's judgment was upon the people of earth. He called people everywhere to bow before God, to prepare their hearts and make way for his kingdom, to prepare for heaven's kingdom because it was about to break forth upon the earth. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. It's near. It's at hand. It's on the way. It's at the very door. You must be ready. Don't delay. Today is the day. You must repent. It is God's command upon you. The Gospel of John explains to us that we are all under the wrath of God. Jesus didn't need to come to condemn the world because the world was already in that state of condemnation. You see, there's nothing that men and women, that you and I, have to do to earn condemnation. We are born under condemnation. We are born in sin, under the law, we are born condemned. And John the Baptist reminded people that there was a holy God on the throne of heaven and his kingdom was about to break forth upon the earth. So everywhere he called out for people to repent, to bow before God, to prepare their hearts, to prepare for heaven's kingdom, and to get ready for Messiah. Messiah. 
here in the Greek, the New Testament, the Christ, the anointed one of God, the specially chosen one who would come, the lamb to take away the sin of the world, the one who was rightful heir of the kingdom, the one who would come to establish God's kingdom. He called people to prepare their hearts, to prepare their lives, to get ready for Messiah. Notice how he speaks of Messiah, the one who comes with fire. Over there in verse 11, he says, There's one coming. There's one coming after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The fiery run, the fiery Christ, the, the Christ who has judgment in his hand, the one to whom all judgment is given, is on his way. He has sent me before him to prepare his way, to prepare for him a people. And I call out to you, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get ready. The Christ is on the way. Messiah is coming, and he is coming with fire. In other words, people might have looked at John the Baptist and thought, what a fiery guy. What a bold and powerful proclamation of the gospel John the Baptist brings. Look how he speaks with divine authority. Look how he commands that sinners repent of their sin. Look how he rebukes those in authority as he would do with Herod. And John the Baptist says, that's nothing. Yes, I've come with the Holy Spirit, but there is one who coming after me who is mightier than I am. He comes with fire. In verse 2, we see his message, his singular sermon, his solemn proclamation, his urgent message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist didn't come as a clever sermonizer. How can I couch my words in such a way? How, how can I be eloquent? How can I be an orator that, that people enjoy listening to? How can I tickle people's ears? He came with a singular sermon. Repent, repent, repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The main message was urgent. There was nothing else that got in his way. There was nothing else that clouded his thoughts. There was nothing else on his mind except for men must repent. The kingdom of heaven is on the way. I am going before the Messiah. People need to get ready. The time is now. The message was urgent. And it was his utmost calling. This great proclamation that he cried out in the wilderness. It was his utmost calling. It was what he was literally born to do. It was something that was upon his life, that weighed upon his life, that pushed him in his life. It was his singular ambition. It was his one motivation to honor God by fulfilling the call upon his life. A great lesson is therein for us. We read about Jeremiah, who the Lord says, I chose you and I formed you before you were born for a certain ministry. Paul, in his testimony, I believe in Galatians chapter 1, speaks in much the same way. God had a design upon my life. He formed me for a certain mission that I was to accomplish. We need to understand that God has a will for our life. It is found in his word. He, is, he has not left us orphans. He has not left us without comfort, without instruction. As we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ in his word, you will know precisely what God wants you to do. Now, these men clearly, the ones that I have mentioned, John the Baptist, Paul the Apostle, Jeremiah the prophet, no doubt these men had very special apostolic ministries, if I can sort of lump them all together. We may not come in that way in the sense of our words are going to be written down in Scripture. We may not come in such a way that we're going to proclaim, thus says the Lord, 
with new revelation. But the old revelation is all that we need. We can tell men and women, thus says the Lord, because I read it in the scripture. We can proclaim God's word as powerfully as Jeremiah, as John the Baptist, as Paul the Apostle. We don't have to make up anything new. We have all that we need for faith and for practice. We have all that we need to share with all those around us. God has claimed us for his own. We do not belong to ourselves. We belong to him. We are in his service. If we are not serving the Lord, we are disobedient to the Lord. And the Lord has given us his message. He has given us his word. We should be growing in it and we should be able to share it. We should be those that the Lord, at a moment's notice, can direct us here, can direct us there, and we are sensitive to his voice. We can be moved by his spirit. Rather than grieve him, we can be used by him. And so John the Baptist sets for us a great example. Just like Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let's imitate John the Baptist as he followed the word of the Lord and proclaimed it with great boldness. John the Baptist, as he brought forth his message, he charged men and women that they must reevaluate their way of living. You must evaluate your life in light of Scripture, in light of the holiness of God. You must reevaluate how you are living in light of the Word of God. You must reconsider your values, your motivations, your goals. Do your values line up with the Word of God? Is your motivation of the Holy Spirit of God? Are your goals Christ-like? Are you pressing forward toward the upward call in Christ? Are you reaching out to claim the prize in Christ? Are you singular in your motivation as a Christian? Or are you double-minded? Is your heart split between two ways? John the Baptist charged men and women, reevaluate your way of living, reconsider your values, repent of your sin and of your idolatry. Because if your way of living does not conform to the scriptures, you have an idol in your life. If your values, motivations, and goals do not line up with the scriptures, then you have an idol in your life and you must repent. You must realign your life with the scripture and thereby to realign your life with the true and the living God whose kingdom is at hand. And of course, that was the force of his message. There was great urgency behind the charge to repent. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is upon you. It is near. It is coming. It's on the way. It's at hand. It, it's pressing in and it is moving sinners aside. Will you be part of the kingdom or will you be cast aside and cast out? Will you be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven or will you be on the outside? Let's go to Revelation. As we think of this application, Revelation, the very last chapter, chapter 22, where the Apostle John, in verse 12, says, And behold, the voice of Jesus here, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, the commandments of God that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside, outside the city, outside of the kingdom, outside are dogs, and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come, and whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. The kingdom of heaven. It was at hand in John the Baptist's day. 
But there's a direct application to our day. We can skip ahead in the story a little bit, and you and I both understand that he was going before the Christ. He was going before Jesus to prepare the way for God's people, to tell them that they must prepare their hearts to receive the Christ who was coming, the Christ who was prophesied and who is now coming upon the earth. See, Christ's kingdom has come. Christ did come. Christ died on the cross for his people to establish his kingdom. We must not make the mistake that his followers back in that day made. Remember when he was there on the Mount of Olives, he was about to leave his disciples. He was about to ascend into the heavens. And they said, aren't you going to establish your kingdom? And they meant very physically. Aren't we going to get to work? We're going to get the survey line out. We're going to get out the plumb line. We're going to establish the walls. We're going to get you a palace and a kingdom. And we're going to, we're going to start doing this thing. And they thought very physically. And over and over and over again, Jesus would say, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not worldly. It's not of this physical, materialistic realm. We must understand that the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, it is amongst us. We are part of his kingdom as we have been adopted as his people. And as his kingdom has come, yet there is also another sense that Jesus would continually tell his people, there's also another age coming in which my kingdom will be further realized upon the earth. Yes, it's come as, as the church we are part of his kingdom. And yet there is coming a day when he will judge the living and the dead. There is coming a day when his kingdom that has been established, that he purchased by his blood on the cross, there is coming a day when that kingdom will be further realized here on the earth. Men may mock today, but they will not mock then when they are brought to their knees before the Christ, before the true king. And we must ask ourselves what John commanded those people in his day to ask themselves. Are we part, are we truly part of his kingdom? You know, I, I appreciate Peter's stern words where he says, make your calling and election sure. If you look inside, if, if you get alone with God, do you truly believe that you are one of his people? Is there, is there fruit of repentance? John the Baptist spoke of the fruits of repentance there in verse 8, but we'll get to that in another message, and we'll develop this idea a little further. Are we hypocrites, or are we truly people of God? Repentance is something that I think we, we come to look at it in terms of, well, I repented and I got saved and it's kind of that one-time thing. But I think over and over the scripture would remind us that God's people are to live a life of repentance. We're to live a life sensitive to the Spirit, sensitive to the words of scripture. A, a life that is really full of daily repentance, confessing our sins daily, considering our ways before Him daily. Having a, a tender heart, a, a broken heart as far as, as our sinfulness is concerned. That, that we truly understand how easy it is for sin to just get in our way and take over. And we need to be a people who are a repentant people. John told the people of his day, and the scripture exhorts us today, repent of your sin. Repent of our sin. I need to repent of my sin. I, I need to be quick to repentance, not stubborn. Not, not holding things off, but dealing with sin when it needs to be dealt with, which is immediately, it's urgent. We must prepare the way. We must make straight his paths. The words of Isaiah speak of, of a highway that has fallen into disrepair. And yet you have received word that the king is about to come. He's on his way to, to your city. And so the officials will send out people to repave the highway, to get the rocks out of the way, to cover up the potholes, to make it nice and smooth for his entry, for his arrival. 
Would to God that his people today in the church today, in our church today, would prepare our hearts, would get those stones of sin out of the way, would make smooth the path that the Holy Spirit could just have an easy access into our life. They, he wouldn't have to fight and wrestle with us the way he had to fight and wrestle with Jacob. Might we learn from the examples of Scripture and prepare our hearts and make straight our paths, the paths of our heart, for him to, to be able to enter in into our life and to have full reign and full access into our hearts. Well, we'll stop there and we'll continue next week in verse 5. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for John the Baptist, your faithful servant, who brought such a powerful message, who brought great glory to you, and who never compromised. Father, might we look to him as a wonderful example of a man, of a person, of a, of a believer who is completely sold out for you, who lives for you without distraction whose greatest ambition, Lord, was to bring honor and glory to you. So, Father, might these words sink deep into our hearts this week, and might you bring us back safely again on Wednesday. In Jesus' name, amen.